Well, hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. <clears throat> Today is May 17th, which is National World Telecommunication and Information Society Day. So the purpose of today is to help raise awareness for the possibilities of the internet. And what would you do without being able to go on Snapchat or Instagram, or even be able to listen to this webinar? So happy National World Telecommunication and Information Society Day. Uh, I am delighted to be able to speak with all of you today at Kroll. We're always looking uh, to provide thoughtful insight and great value to our clients to help them defend their organization against the latest cyber threats and improve their cyber maturity. Uh, my name is Keith Wojcik. I'm a managing director and global head of threat intelligence for Cool Cyber Risk and, and based in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, I've been with Cool for about six years and worked for the U.S. Secret Service prior, where I was able to have the opportunity to lead the service's cyber threat intelligence program. Before we get started, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. Today's session will be recorded and will be, will be available after the briefing. We're using GoToWebinar, as you know, for this presentation, and you'll find the client on your monitor. Through that client, you'll be able to submit questions at any time, and the presenters will address questions at the end. <clears throat> so to get into things, Kroll Cyber carried out approximately 3,000 engagements in 2022. Uh, today, we'll be taking a look at the current trends that our threat intelligence team has seen and highlighting the first quarter of 2023. We are in a unique position to deliver end-to-end -end cybersecurity solutions across several different service lines. We have a wealth of experience with over 650 cybersecurity experts uh, on the Kroll team who are working around the globe with companies of many sizes, varieties of industries, and work with over 60 ins insurance carriers. This gives us tremendous visibility into what's going on on the front lines. Uh, in this session, today we're going to cover the cyber threat landscape with a focus on quarter one. Kroll saw a 57% increase in attacks against professional service sector and a 56% increase in the number of unique ransomware variants. Kroll has also seen a rise in exfiltration followed by extortion without encryption. We are very fortunate uh, to have leading Kroll experts join us today to talk about intelligence from the trenches. Uh, we are joined by Lori Icono, George Glass, and Ryan Hicks. Lori is an Associate Managing Director in Kroll Cyber Risk. Lori manages the day-to-day -day functions for the Cyber Threat Intelligence Team, including the support of active incident response engagements. A prior to Kroll, Lori managed the Brand and Consumer Protection Program at the National Cyber Forensics Training Alliance, or the NCFTA, which is located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. George Glass is a Senior Vice President in the Cyber Risk Practice, responsible for ensuring that the latest threat actor intelligence is applied to our proprietary XDR platform used to power the managed detection and response service to clients around the globe. Before joining Kroll, George had a background working across defense, finance, and e-commerce sectors in the UK. Uh, Ryan Hicks is a senior associate in the cyber risk practice and applies the latest threat actor intelligence to a proprietary XDR platform. Before joining Kroll, Ryan delivers strategic and technical cyber threat intelligence to operations worldwide throughout supporting the Royal Air Force Special Operations Command and Incident Response. Now I'll turn it to Lori to give us more insight to the cyber threat landscape. Lori? Thanks for that introduction, Keith. Um, so for those of you who are, are returning to one of our threat landscape se uh, sessions, I would say thank you, um, welcome back. Um, and for those of you who may be joining one of our sessions for the first time, I always start out by giving a little bit of um, background and methodology of, of what you'll be seeing here today. So, you know, all of the graphs and data that you will be seeing are from our incident response cases. So this is where an actual cyber attack or intrusion has occurred. Um, and we're collecting some data on that to, to, to you know, help inform uh, everyone on what is happening. Once we take that data, we look at it uh, monthly, we look at it quarterly, we overlay that with uh, intelligence that we're seeing on the dark web, in forums and marketplaces, as well as insights that we're seeing um, from other security researchers on, on open source sources. Um, and this helps us identify uh, what we feel are the top themes and trends uh, during a given quarter order that we want our, our clients and the public to know about. So uh, starting out the, today's session, we're going to first talk about uh, sector analysis. So if we go on to the slide here, 
we're, we're looking at, you know, basically the top five sectors that Kroll was seeing targeted in our incident response cases. Now in Q4, we had highlighted threats, uh, particularly we were seeing a lot of activity impacting the technology sector and manufacturing sector. As you can see, they are still in our top five um, that we were observing, but we, we saw, you know, kind of slight dec declines with that group. Um, I do want to point out, you know, we are seeing a, a quarter or quarter over trend there that we're seeing with respect to the retail sector. Um, this is likely due to the attractiveness of, of payment card data to threat actors right now. Um, there is a lot of carding activity that we're seeing on the dark web, um, and we've been seeing a, kind of a direct rise in that since the outset of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Um, and then we also are aware of several ongoing campaigns, such as Magecart, um, that are likely ticking that, uh, you know, targeting of the retail sector up. Uh, but where one of our, you know, big stories of Q1 was, was uh, the professional services sector. And you can see here, we saw actually a 57% increase in targeting of the professional services sector in the first quarter. Uh, now, the professional services sector is one that we group a lot of, uh, you know, professional services firms into, uh, things like real estate, uh, accounting, um, and law firms uh, fall into that umbrella. And what we were seeing in the first quarter was some, you know, of those professional services uh, uh, cases that we were seeing, we were seeing a lot of them impacting law firms. Uh, we know, you know, we, we've always known that the law firms are very attractive to threat actors. They hold a large amount of confidential data, um, such as information related to, you know, research and development, sensitive client matters, as well as some financial data related to mergers and acquisitions. So that all makes them a very uh, juicy target, I would say, for threat actors, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, in the first quarter, what we were seeing sometimes, uh, the attacks that we were seeing against law firms, uh, a lot of times or most of the time we were seeing them involve exfiltration of data um, and then after that exfil of data there was some kind of uh, you know financial extortion attempt usually um, and sometimes we were seeing encryption with that so if we go on to the next slide here um, it does show that professional services was uh, unfortunately, the top targeted sector that we were seeing uh, with respect to our ransomware cases in the first quarter, kind of rounding out the top five there was manufacturing, a retail restaurant, tech, um, as well as financial services. Now, in particular, uh, as I mentioned, you know, with the law firms, we were seeing a campaign uh, involving a malware called Gutloader. And I'm going to hand it over to Ryan here to kind of talk a little bit more in depth about that specific malware uh, and what we were seeing with respect to initial access, as well as, uh, you know, post-exploitation activity once they were in the network. Uh, thank you, Laurie, and uh, hi, everyone. So, yeah, I'm going to provide a, a small insight into to Coot Loader compromises um, that we observed quite recently, um, which links back to the previous slide that, that Laurie was showing um, as we've indeed seen uh, kind of professional services, uh, manufacturing, financial, um, as well as legal, as you said, um, among those hit with Gutloader quite recently. So Gutloader is observed during the initial access phase of compromise. Um, it's commonly seen distributed by uh, search engine optimization or, or hosted on compromised sites. Um, and just to go over search engine optimization, if you're unfamiliar, uh, this is where a threat actor, a threat actor will create a website, um, likely cloning a, a legitimate website, and they're looking to perform various techniques. Um, this is to ensure that their um, website appears at the top of search results, and um, therefore more likely to, to be get, getting clicked by a victim. Uh, and Threctors have also been observed compromising legitimate websites, um, mainly uh, WordPress sites, um, using a number of vulnerabilities to gain access. And then they host their malicious content um, as a sort of watering hole uh, for, for victims to, to, to reach out and, and grab that malicious content. Again, this all provides an additional layer of legitimacy for, for the, and trust uh, for victims. So the benefits for uh, Thraktor really um, with this kind of social engineering is much harder for defenders to detect this activity at this stage um, as there is no interaction with the um, victim infrastructure at this point. It's just sort of essentially just sitting there uh, waiting for a user to, to reach out uh, and interact and grab that, that content and running it. 
In terms of theming for Gootloader, um, really we've seen these centered around business related themes um, such as legal matters, agreements and contracts. Um, and the image on the left there shows um, the targeting of legal professionals um, and searching for templates, just as one example. And the bottom image shows a few examples of the file names we've seen. Um, each law has a direct correlation to uh, the victim organization that, it, um, that became victim. Again, this reinforces the idea that the, the, the organizations, uh, the users um, are seeking out um, assistance to their work uh, and business by searching for information um, related to their work uh, and becoming victim due to these laws. And the top one in particular is quite interesting, uh, and that relates to US state tax information. Uh, and that was actually seen during the middle of uh, the US tax calendar. Um, so threat actors uh, appear to certainly be adapting to key dates to change their th uh, thematics, similar to how we would normally see it as well with um, phishing lures. And Goot loader infections typically lead to large scale exfiltration uh, of data, um, and in some cases extortion um, threats, which uh, Laurie touched on. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, uh, we're just going to go through uh, a typical attack chain for Gootloader, um, which we observed in March and April um, this year, so quite recently. And this starts with a zip file, um, which is downloaded from a browser, as, as I mentioned um, previously, through various social engineering techniques. Um, and like many of these initial access vectors that we see, this requires a user to interact several times, uh, even after the, the file has been downloaded. And in this case, uh, we see the user has to um, not only download the, the file, reach out, find the information and, and download it, um, but they also have to unzip the, the file and then run the malicious JavaScript file um, that then really kicks off the rest of the compromise. So once the malicious um, JavaScript file is executed, um, a second file, a second JavaScript file is dropped, um, which we observed um, several times in the roaming uh, Adobe directory. Uh, next up, um, going back to the kind of initial um, script, um, this goes on to create a registry key, um, and that adds a root certificate. It then goes on to create a schedule task, um, typically pointing to the second JavaScript file for persistence. And in other incident response cases, um, we also observed um, the um, execution of Cobalt Strike DLL uh, as part of that schedule task, so kind of interchangeable, really, on, on what was in that schedule task and what was executed. And you see on the left there the names of the schedule tasks. Um, although um, we didn't really um, have any correlation to between the names and the victims, um, they're certainly noticeable uh, as names of scheduled tasks and should um, hopefully stand out amongst legitimate names and, and legitimate activity. And then moving on to the second JavaScript file, that spawned uh, Windows PowerShell um, using WScript and CScript, uh, and that was seen um, communicating to uh, command and control IP addresses and domains. The PowerShell as well performed various host enumeration, um, and one such enumeration script uh, was seen in uh, instant response, uh, was called pshound.ps1. Uh, and that appears to be a variation of uh, the Bloodhound uh, well-known enumeration tool. Uh, fortunately, in these cases, uh, further malicious actions were prevented, um, and these were following alerts from our behavioral detections. Uh, and these particular alerts were for uh, a script file um, creating a scheduled task, um, and then the second one being a script process um, spawning PowerShell, um, and then followed by external connections. Um, so these detections really kind of following kind of chains of events um, to then eventually alert um, uh, the SOC and then cause the, the incident incident response to to happen. So these caused analysts to quickly respond and contain these incidents. Um, however, in the world, um, outside of, of, of this sort of case study, um, Gootloader has additionally been seen um, leading to installations of uh, co further Cobalt Strike payloads, as well as Gootkit, which is a, a sophisticated banking trojan. So just to summarize um, this particular case study, um, so Gootloader um, has been seen delivered widely through um, search engine optimization um, poisoning and also through um, compromised sites. And as I mentioned, the, the social engineering targeting really was around business related laws, again, really centered around um, users seeking out inf um, the information that they want for uh, work purposes and then falling victim. And this could potentially lead to not only Gootkit and Cobalt Strike, as I mentioned, um, but this is really just setting a foothold for a threat actor, so potentially other malware families related to data theft uh, and ransomware. And just to um, finish off with uh, recommendations, really user uh, education um, is a really important step in reducing this risk of, of initial access, um, particularly when searching for information um, 
we can often feel quite secure when we're going out and, and grabbing information, feel maybe more in control um, when we're kind of um, actually searching for this. However, this really reminds us to, to stay vigilant in that. And then the behavioral detection I really wanted to highlight um, in alerting early in the, in the kill chain, uh, again, chaining these kind of um, suspicious processes together um, can really create um, powerful alerting, which we've definitely found um, extremely um, uh, powerful here yeah. um, for, for a number of range of threats, not just Gootkit, um, but a, a wide range of malware families. And with that, I'll hand back to Laurie um, to continue uh, the in initial access theme. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, so pivoting off of, you know, this example that Ryan gave, we're going to talk a little bit more about what we were seeing with respects to initial access in the first quarter. Um, so if we go to the next slide here, uh, this one just shows the top five access methods that we were seeing in our cases. So again, as I said, these are cases where there, you know, some kind of intrusion or attack actually occurred. Um, you can see here phishing continues to be, you know, there was a, like a less of it so in this last quarter, but it still was our top uh, initial access method that we, we were seeing in our cases. And we always say, you know, sometimes that's surprising, but that's the reason threat actors use phishing is because it works, right? Um, also, uh, we were seeing, uh, you know, slight increases there around valid accounts um, in external services. Uh, that's always a really good reminder. Sometimes those valid accounts and ex external remote service exploitation, we kind of see that in conjunction. People are finding those creds and then they're using it to get in uh, via an open RDP um, or some kind of vulnerable VPN device. So it's just a really good reminder here, um, highlighting the importance of multi-factor authentication. Um, so that way, even if actors are able to get legitimate credentials, um, it's harder for them uh, to get into the system uh, just on those creds alone. Now, if you've been joining the, the threat landscape sessions uh, for the last few quarters, you'll know that we've been talking a lot about the evolution of phishing. Um, so as I said, uh, threat actors use it because it works. Um, we also see them kind of continuously improving what they're doing with respects to phishing so that it works, uh, it continues to work. Um, so we've covered, you know, last year we talked about uh, phishing attacks going from using Office doc files to using container files like .iso or .lmk. Um, more recently, we've talked about them using uh, OneNote files or .xml files. Um, and then uh, this past quarter, we were seeing some activity with them using .pdf files, uh, which seems, you know, kind of kind of old school after all this evolution. But again, another way that threat actors are keeping us on our toes. Um, so I'm going to have George next talk a little bit about what we're seeing uh, with respect to some phishing campaigns involving Quackbot. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd just like to start off uh, the, the malware section um, by uh, giving you an idea of the, the change in trends that we've seen um, since Q4 uh, and going into Q1. Um, this is a, sort of an overview of the landscape when it comes to um, our malware indicator of compromise collection. Um, and this incorporates information from our investigations, the MDR side of the, uh, the operation, um, but also from our infrastructure tracking and collection of open source information as well. Um, so this is a, a, a very big data set here. And essentially how this works is the higher up the list, uh, the bigger the change observed from, from the previous quarter. Um, and as, as you can see, we've uh, observed an increase in the sliver toolkit, uh, which is being used by threat actors as an alternative to the cobalt strike penetration, penetration testing framework. Um, although obviously we still see significant usage of, of uh, cobalt strike as well. Uh, as Ryan was mentioning, we've, uh, we've also been able to collect a lot more information on um, malware such as GootKit and GootLoader. Um, and, you know, as you can see down there, um, as Laura is mentioning, um, Quackbot is, is tracking true in, in, in the number eight spots. Uh, we actually collect a huge amount of IOCs for this malware. And, and if we were to order this list in, by the number of um, indicators uh, collected, uh, Quackbot would easily uh, top that list. Um, and but the numbers that we're tracking uh, for Quackbot this quarter are, are similar to that that we saw in, in, in Q4 of 2022. So let's talk some more about Quackbot. Um, as I said, if you've been to a quarterly briefing before, uh, you've heard, heard me talk about this uh, quite a few times. Um, but for a refresher and those that aren't aware, Quackbot, uh, sometimes called um, QBot or Pink Slip Bot, 
uh, is an information stealing Trojan, um, but it's been leveraged uh, for some time as a sort of a remote access tool and a featured establishing toolkit to deploy um, additional malicious tools like Sliver or Cobalt Strike. Um, Quackbot is, is a well-known uh, initial access vector for the Blackbuster ransomware group. Um, and in Q1, we actually observed a, a, a higher than usual infection rate for some of the Quackbot campaigns um, that were, were impacting uh, globally. Um, likely stemming from, as I mentioned, better um, social engineering laws, um, with some of the cases we saw coming in via customer support forms, uh, which was a tactic we saw from ICE ID in, in 2022. Um, so let's let's take a look at, at how, how some of these come through. So the, the phishing email um, contains a, a, a zip file, and that, that zip file is um, basically a, a PDF. Um, and that PDF uh, basically contains a link uh, to an external site controlled by the attacker. Um, so if we take a look at some of the PDFs uh, that were um, so effective, you can see they, they do share um, very similar laws here. Now we've, we've chosen two Microsoft products here because that is far and away, um, I think we saw most, but this could easily be Dropbox or uh, Adobe, um, and that they all share various similarities, right? There's a, a huge brand impersonation logo, um, which is obviously designed to um, increase user trust in, in what they're looking at here. Um, and then everything else is encouraging the user to click that big open button right there. And below the open button, uh, you'll see a password. Uh, we've actually redacted the password in these campaigns because you can use it to identify campaigns. Um, but uh, sometimes the the, uh, the, the download uh, link has a password protection on it. Again, something designed to bypass inline defensive technology, um, stop sort of inline scanning and, and things like that. Um, but they all share very, very uh, similar social engineering laws. So what happens when that user um, clicks the, the open button? Uh, and again, this is a really good place to point out a lot of user interaction has to happen here. Um, so once the user has downloaded the zip file, uh, which as I said, may or may not be password protected, um, the user will click on a JavaScript file. Again, sort of very similar to the, the Goot Loader Goot Kit infection chain. Um, uh, and this file is the loader for Quackbot which downloads the Quackbot TLL and injects it into the, uh, the Wemager process, uh, which is a Windows service uh, sort of for problem reporting. Um, and now that, that in injection there um, initiates uh, the, the Quackbot malware. And from here, it starts to execute all of the sort of behavior that is um, sort of familiar with those that know Quackbot, um, doing automated reconnaissance commands with using net and IP config and so on, um, and beginning to uh, collect information ready to send back up to the command and, uh, and control uh, server. Um, so we're actually going to come back to this uh, um, in infection chain a, a little bit later on um, and uh, look at how the, the Blackbuster operators uh, use this uh, tool and, and use it to deploy other tooling uh, for data exfiltration and encryption a little bit later on. Uh, but for now, I'm going to hand the, uh, the mic back to Laurie. Over to you. Thanks, George. Um, so now we're going to spotlight specifically on what we've been seeing with ransomware in, uh, or what we saw with ransomware in the first quarter. Uh, so if we go to the next slide here, we can look at the top 10 uh, ransomware variants that we're seeing. And you can see that Lockbit uh, by and far was the, the one that we were seeing the most often in our caseloads. Um, this is reflected if you would look at the statistics around the Lockbit actor controlled site. Um, they by and far had the most uh, victims posted in the, in the first quarter of 2023, showing how active they are. Um, you can also see, uh, we did see some gains from Black Hat. Um, as well as we were seeing some activity with CLOP. Uh, CLOP activity uh, started spiking at the end of the first quarter. Um, most of this was related to the Go Anywhere uh, zero day vulnerability. Um, this was one that they claimed they uh, had exploited over 130 victims. I think it was in February when they made that claim. Um, and then there between the end of February to the middle of March, we saw their uh, victim site go from it had basically been uh, dead for like 16 months or so, no new uh, victims listed. Um, and all of a sudden now there's like over 100 victims that are listed on that site. So showing how active uh, they were in the first quarter. 
Um, and, you know, in general, looking at this top nine, um, you know, a lot of them are kind of what we would call like the usual suspects with the large, uh, high profile ransomware as a service uh, groups. Um, Hive was one that we were seeing a lot of. Uh, Hive now we know has has actually, uh, you know, was, was shut down um, early in Q1, but we were seeing a lot of activity prior to that. Um, so, you know, um, it, at the bottom, though, of this list, even though the top nine are kind of those, you know, the, the same old players in the ransomware as a service sphere, um, you can see there on, on the bottom, this variant uh, that made it into our top nine of Exorist. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, particular variant later. But, you know, if if you were to break down kind of the list of all variants that we saw in the first quarter, you see that it's a pretty long list, um, you know, more than we could fit on the screen. So if we go over to the next slide, um, you know, and we were kind of hearing anecdotally from our incident responders that they were seeing more of these what they called kind of one off uh, ransomware incidents. So we did some analysis looking at, uh, you know, how many variants we saw in the first quarter, comparing that to how many variants we saw in Q4 of 2022. And what we found was that in the first quarter of this year, we saw um, a rise in new or unique variants. Um, so these were variants either that we had never observed before or ones that we hadn't observed in a long time. Um, and it kind of, you know, illustrated to us the kind of shifts that we're seeing now in, in the ransomware ecosphere. So while we still have the large high profile ransomware as a service groups like Lockbit, um, the, the playing field has been open for a lot of uh, lower level groups to also get into the ransomware game. Um, I think that was illustrated very nicely. There was some reporting this week, I believe, by Sentinel One um, related to, uh, you know, some analysis of how many ransomware groups are active right now that are using Bavic source code. Um, so Bavic was just one of many ransomware lockers where their source code was posted uh, on, a, on a dark web forum for other actors to grab. So we, we believe that a lot of the activity we're seeing now is, is kind of actors taking advantage um, of this kind of data that's out there. So we're seeing this proliferation of uh, new and unique groups. Now, I mentioned um, you know, that I wanted to talk a little bit about Exorist. Um, so Exorist is a good example of this. So Exorist is one where uh, there's a builder that's basically available for purchase on the dark web. Um, any cyber criminal with access to that can go out and purchase it, customize it to their means, um, and launch a ransomware attack. Um, so sometimes, you know, how are these kind of attacks different from the high profile attacks or are they different, right? That's the question. Um, yes, they are different in, in, in many ways. So for example, an Exorist attack, uh, we tend to see with some of these a smaller scale of encryption. Um, so maybe they're not able to encrypt the, an entire network like a lockbit may be able to do, um, but they're you know encrypting a, a, a small file share or, or at least one server. Um, we also, with some of these like one-off or independent ransomware groups, we don't see uh, quite as much exfiltration, uh, likely because they don't have a, a, a site or a hosting space to like store that on some kind of a site. Um, so that is one kind of one kind of difference. Um, but as far as for, for initial access, they tend to go uh, very similar to larger groups. They tend to go after you know low-hanging fruit for access, particularly high-profile. Uh, CVEs or vulnerabilities that haven't been patched for in an organization. I also want to highlight another a new ransomware group that we observed in the first quarter. Um, and we've actually done uh, some reporting on it uh, from the Kroll side. This is a ransomware group called, or ransomware variant called Cactus. Um, and I think uh, on the marketing side, we might be putting the link to that particular article up there in the chat if you haven't already seen it. Uh, but Cactus is one that we observed uh, for the first time in Q1. Um, when we, you know, conducted open source research, it, it appeared that this was an, an entirely new variant. Um, the novel thing about Cactus is that the binary encrypts itself uh, while it's on the network, helping it to further helping it to evade detection. 
Um, and we are seeing this group, again, you know, mentioning external remote services earlier for initial access. That's what we're seeing that the, the uh, Cactus variants are going after vulnerabilities to VPN appliances for initial access. Um, they are also exfiltrating during attacks, um, although at this time we haven't observed a corresponding actor controlled site. Um, so speaking of that exfiltration, uh, that is a good segue to the next section where we're going to focus specifically on exfiltration and how to detect it. Uh, so looking at this next slide, um, these are our most popular threat incident types uh, that we've seen in the last quarter. Um, really no big surprises here, I guess. You ransomware and, and email compromise continue to be number one and number two. Uh, but something we've been seeing a lot more of in our cases across threat incident types is this use of exfil. Um, so that's why, you know, certainly for this quarterly report, we wanted to give everyone tips on how to identify that kind of activity in their network. So I'm going to pass it over to George now, um, and he's going to go into more of the weeds and talk about, you know, how to detect that exfiltration before it leads to something else. Yeah, thank you, Laurie. Uh, so yeah, let's get back to our Crackbot Blackbuster case study. Uh, we left off uh, having had a user download and execute a malicious JavaScript file, uh, which injected a quite bot into the, the webmager process. Um, and this injected process, this, this quite bot process, uh, will be used to deliver additional tooling, such as Cobalt Strike, Bloodhound, um, and other scripts to aid in, in, in lateral movement activities, uh, basically to allow the actor to explore the network, um, understand the layout where sensitive files may be stored, identify backup servers, so on and so forth. Um, and once the, um, the black mass operators uh, have identified uh, data to exfiltrate, uh, we observe them using tools such as Rclone um, to rapidly exfil that data to cloud services such as Mega or, um, or other file sharing sites. Um, one of the things that, that they use Mega for is for that rapid exfiltration um, and then as, as Laurie said the, the more sophisticated groups will download from, from Mega um, and host it on their own servers so it doesn't live in Mega for long it's just sort of a, an intermediary point for them to store that, that data um, and then once sufficient data has been exfiltrated that the, the Black Bass uh, actors believe they can uh, pull off an effective double extortion um, the Black Bass uh, encryptor is deployed to endpoints and uh, ransomware commences from there um, so a, a pretty uh, significant um, kill chain there, as you can see, as, as we mentioned before, quite a lot of uh, this relies on uh, heavy amounts of user interaction um, in, the, in the earlier stages of this, of this kill chain. Um, so let's, let's quickly take a look at, at some of the, uh, the things we can do to, to mitigate some of this risk, right? So um, there's really three pillars that the organizations may, may consider focusing on. Um, let's, let's talk about network first. Um, network detection isn't quite a, a one-size-fits-all um, solution to this problem, uh, but I just want to sort of give you some ideas of, of things that you may consider uh, detecting. Um, first of all, for, for most sort of uh, network appliances, you may be able to detect uh, large file transfers out of the organization. Um, maybe if large file transfers are sort of day-to-day -day activities for your, for your network, uh, you may consider uh, detecting it at strange times, Friday evening, you know, Sunday, Sunday midday, certainly strange times for, for large amounts of data to be leaving the organization. Um, and for more sophisticated network appliances, um, consider um, you know, doing traffic inspection for sensitive data, identifying files that are leaving the network uh, in that way. Obviously, you know, as I said, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, but for, for some of those network appliances that allow for that, uh, that's a, a really good uh, detector, not just for this particular risk, uh, but maybe for insider threats and so on and so forth. Let's skip endpoint for the moment and, and move over to controls. Um, controls are, are some of the easiest things to apply uh, when it comes to uh, you know, not stopping a ransomware attack, but significantly slowing it down, giving more time to detect and respond. Um, so you know again blocking access to to common file sharing sites and, and in the quarterly report we um we give a, a list of uh common sites which you know you may consider blocking um, probably not going to be used in day-to-day -day activity but certainly are used by threat actors um certainly network segmentation you know that's network and control again um threat actors will go for backups 
and will uh, encrypt those backups. Um, and so network segmentation really does stop that, um, or at least significantly slow down that um, part of the attack down and we can seriously aid in recovery uh, after the fact as well. And then application allow listing, uh, you know, do your users need to be able to run our clone on their on their device? You know, that's that's up to net, uh, you know administrators, um, but uh, certainly a, a a consideration there. And I'll, I'll share in a second uh, some some applications that you may consider blocking. And now let's let's go to the endpoints. Um, so our clone um, installation and renaming. You know, we've we've built some detection ruling for this uh, specifically to detect this. Uh, method of exfiltration and I, I believe we'll be sharing um, some signal rolling uh, just as an example of, of how that, that detection logic works um, so you're, you're, you're more than welcome to, to use that in, in your own environment if you wish um, another sort of early sign of uh, exfiltration is the deployment of tools like 7-zip and WinRAR um, what threat actors will usually do is, is collect the information in one place and then start to um, compress it and uh, in, encrypt those um, compressed files ready to stage for exfiltration. So detecting unusual activity uh, in regards to these applications is a really good um, indicator of, of you know, something potentially going wrong. And th at this point, I really want to say detecting at this point is really the last port of call in the a threat actor kill chain, right? Um, so detecting at this point is really the last thing that happens before ransomware deployment. So it's so important to be able to detect um, at least this activity. Obviously, we want to be able to detect as far down the kill chain as we possibly can, um, but that's why we're, we're focusing so heavily on that uh, in, in this quarterly uh, update. And then there are some other um, things that you may consider monitoring. Um, system uh, Resource Uses Manager, um, Things that are used by um, certain uh, tools that threat actors may may use for their lateral movement, collecting of files, and things like that. Um, endpoint controls there can can certainly help you. And it, it, uh, as part of the MDR side of the, the business, we, we we really try to encourage all of these uh, as a, a defense in depth um, uh, mitigation strategy for for a lot of these uh, these attack types. So uh, I promised you a list of uh, some some of the tools that threat actors use. Uh, let's see how that's broken down by uh, by some of the more prolific ransomware groups. So as you can see here, MegaSync uh, does make up a, a, another significant portion of, of what we see. That's designed to sync directly to mega.com. Uh, FileZilla, that's a, a slightly interesting one, maybe more common in uh, business environments. You may see that uh, being used uh, perfectly legitimately. Um, so, you know, that really does lend itself to, to blending into legitimate activity. And as we've been discussing, uh, our clone, right? Our clones used by um, Lockbit, Hive Ransomware Group, Raw Ransomware Group. Um, and so our clone is, I think, by far and away, one of the things that we see the most of uh, when it comes to, to exfiltration there. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to uh, pass the, the mic back to Laurie uh, to, uh, to summarize what we've talked about today. Over to you, Laurie. Thanks, George. Yeah, so just to summarize, you know, what we were seeing in the first quarter of 2023, uh, you know, we started out the session talking about an increase in attacks against professional services sector, particularly law firms. Um, and there we were seeing uh, the activity with a Gootloader campaign. Um, we also were seeing phishing remain the top initial access method, um, but some, you know, continued evolution uh, in that in those kind of campaigns. Uh, with respect to ransomware, although we do see the you know high profile ransomware as a service operation still be the biggest players, uh, we continue to see a lot of splintering uh, in that landscape um, into smaller, uh, probably you know freelance or one-off groups. We also have observed uh, an increase an increase in exfiltration of data uh, across a threat incident types. And I think it was a really, really good point that George uh, mentioned in his section there talking about, you know, ex detecting exfiltration. Uh, many times that is kind of the last step um, in the kill chain until the, that you have to, to stop things before they progress. It's something that can be uh, very disastrous uh, for your network, such as encryption. Um, so I'm going to hand it over uh, back over to George Ryan to talk us through a little bit about, you know, what 
actions organizations can take to mitigate against some of these risks. Yeah, thank you, Laurie. Um, so, as I said before, um, all of the, the controls that I mentioned are a really good place to, to start, right? They're, they should be the easiest to roll out. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend uh, studying those and, and understanding how they would uh, work best for your, your network, um, especially network segmentation. That's, that's a, a really easy way to, well, not easy, uh, but a really good way of stopping um, uh, ransomware actors from, from easily maneuvering in the environment and moving laterally. Uh, as as well, um, I'm going to hand over to Ryan to to take us through the the last of the uh, the uh, actions here. Thank you. I was just um, going to point out, similar to how I mentioned earlier, just on that last point of of pro providing security training to employees, it's something that certainly comes up a lot in our recommendations, almost um, every week when we when we provide our weekly report. Um, and whilst providing the the security training, it's not only kind of phishing that. Um, um, we're kind of looking at, but also things I mentioned within Goot Loader, such as those kind of watering style attacks, just making users aware uh, that it's not only um, phishing attempts that could potentially um, target users, but also um, when they're going out and finding information. And it's also um, on on us uh, and as security professionals as well um, to, to to provide anything that we can do to help users as well to visually understand the threats. So. Um, just to provide any kind of examples of these kind of emails, examples of of, of, of websites that are malicious that users can visit is, is really powerful and helpful for, for users to to understand the threat as well. And of course, threat intelligence um, as can help to inform that. Um, of course, um, things like the posters that George um, showed earlier on Quackbot, um, we think that's really um, handy to to again visualize to, to users um, so they can keep in the back of their minds when they are um, either um, browsing emails or, or browsing the internet. Um, they kind of got in the back of their minds that, that um, they kind of understand and see these threats. Um, so that's all from, from the recommendations. I'll hand back to Keith just for um, questions and closing remarks. Keith, you might be on mute. <laughs> Sorry, it's more than that. Like, uh, I love I love go to webinar. I love go to webinar, but the the clients all over the place. So I do apologize. That's my fault. Uh, the suspense. I'm trying to build the suspense up for these amazing questions we're getting in here today. So you know, we have a few minutes now. George, Lori, Ryan did an amazing job describing some of these trends we've seen. There's a lot of questions that came in. I really want to encourage you to to ask questions live with the, with these experts on the line. Uh, so a quick reminder to type your questions in. To the chat box uh, we did have a couple come in i'm just going to start with the first one so the one is uh where there is exfiltration but no encryption what is the financial reward motivation for the threat actor and are, are there other are selling methods are there other areas where they're they're making money uh, Lori, i want to turn that to you to start yeah so i mean that's a good question and, and we actually see a lot of those cases where it's just exfiltration um, and, you know, usually what happens there is there is an extortion attempt that is basically saying, um, you know, if you don't pay us whatever sum of money, we're going to publish this data. Um, and now the, you know, organization has, you know, first of all, a potential data breach on their hands, right? Because especially if the actor's got PII, um, or in some cases, protected health information, um, for that to go publicly somewhere now, it's kind of like they have to disclose that there's an incident and that that data is out there. Um, so we like that seems to be kind of the main mo motivation for these actors um, that are exfiltrating is to basically hold that data um, over the head of whatever uh, victim organization a as a means to to get some kind of financial payout. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate that. That was great. And and you know, the, the, there's a bunch, there's a bunch of questions coming in. I want to I want to address something that I think is actually pretty good. And George, Lori, you may be able to help with this one. Um, this one is if we apply security policy blocking Mega and other file sharing sites or cloud sites, do you see this blocking a ransomware event, or will it continue? And uh, and we should use it as a detect and respond. Like, what do we do with with these cloud repositories that they utilize? What's what's the answer for something like that? And George, I'll just pass that to you. Um, yeah, thank you, Keith. Um, so, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, 
unfortunately, there's there's no sort of panacea to uh, to solving a ransomware attack. Um, blocking those sites really is a, a way of frustrating the attacker uh, and slowing them down. Um, that will not stop a ransomware attack from happening. And indeed, you know, maybe they don't exfiltrate data, but they still encrypt your environment, right? Um, so the, the best thing to do, as you quite rightly said, is use that as an opportunity to say, okay, we have a connection to this site, or, or at least an attempted connection to this site, that should raise an alarm and it should be investigated and, and remediated. Um, obviously, anything like that that could be ransomware related should be treated as a sort of a priority one uh, alert. Exactly. Uh, that's priority one for sure. Uh, thank, thank you, George. Appreciate it. Now, we're, we're almost at, we're out of time, but I, I do want, there's one question here that, that I think is important. We touched it a little bit, Ryan, you touched a little bit. And maybe just, just talk just, just real briefly is, you know, what are your recommendations on key security controls to prevent, detect, and respond to the attacks you are seeing? So I know, like, again, I know we went over that, but are there anything else? What, what, what are we seeing? What can we do? And that's the biggest thing here we're talking about to defend ourselves against these bad guys. What do we do? How do we do that? Ryan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to you. Yeah, so the, and so I've touched on it um, a little bit within, with, with Gootloader, but certainly something that we, we're seeing across a number of cases is these, um, these sort of generic, um, generic detections, uh, and George mentioned it as well with the, the Sigma rules. Um, we obviously, um, we, we collect it and, and talk about a lot of different malware families, and you can easily get flooded with, same different malware families, different ransomwares, uh, and it's hard to um, kind of whack them all, each individual one. So I think these, as well as obviously the other recommendations, the on the detection side, um, the kind of generic um, behavioral detections, um, looking for suspicious uh, chains of events um, that, again, not necessarily blocking um, uh, the activity happening, but alerting, and then that kind of spins up instant response. I think is uh, is really important. Um, again, it's um, it, it's those kind of generic things that, um, it, even if it's a new malware variant or, or ransomware um, or, or download or whatever it might be, again, this potentially um, could could spin up um, detections um, where they reuse a, a lot of similar um, techniques um, that we've already seen and build detections for. So I think um, that's certainly one of the the key um, and recommendations and controls that I, I, I put out there. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Um, man, we can't be getting questions. Sean, Lee, uh, Charles, Lizzie, uh, TZ, we'll get we'll get back to you. We'll answer your questions. Uh, we, sadly, we're, we're out of time today, uh, but we will we'll answer some of those questions you, you, you've asked. Uh, a big thank you to everybody that has taken the time to tune in. We hope you find this session informative. We're, we're still accepting questions, especially if you want to see the Bills win the Super Bowl. Love to hear that. Um, as you can see, I'm a Bills fan in the background. Uh, but just to let you know, we have published our quarter one 2023 threat landscape report on the Coral website, as well as the Cactus report um, that was written by our team. So if you want to go into more details of the trends and Cactus uh, that we outlined today, then please read the report. You can also find a copy of it in the handout section and go to webinar. Uh, when you leave the briefing, you'll be directed to a short survey. If you could spare a few moments, we'd greatly appreciate it if you tell us your thoughts on the session. It really helps us prepare for next sessions, what you want how we uh, organize it in the question. So we really appreciate all the feedback. So once again, thanks a lot for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at one of the future briefings. Take care.